It's the afternoon of March 23rd, 2010. I'm Michael Aaron of NJN News here for the Rutgers program on the governor. We're in West Orange today in the legislative office of Governor Dick Cody. Dick Cody served as governor when Governor Jim McGreevy stepped down before his first term ended and before the election of 2005. He's been in the legislature since 1974. He was elected in 1973 from West Orange, served in the assembly during the eight years of Governor Brendan Byrne, was elected to the state senate the year that Tom Kane was elected governor, 1981. He has seen a lot of governors come and go. He's been a governor, and we're going to talk to him about that. Governor, before we ask you about the Brendan Byrne years, uh, we're interested in your reflections on the governorship a little bit since you served in it, uh, and wondering, first off, whether it's the same office it was in 1974, or whether it's a different office today. Well, that's a tough question to answer, Mike, because obviously I wasn't in the governor's office in 74. I was down in the assembly, and I was the youngest one ever in that chamber, or even either house, to be honest How old with were you. you? I was 26 when I got elected. Um, I think what has changed is obviously the growth of uh, state government, without question. Um, and the influence of the governor's office vis-a-vis -vis the legislature has, in my opinion, been severely diminished. Uh, as the legislature got more uh, staff, uh, they grew more independent of um, the governor's office. It used to be that the governor's office, if the governor was a Democrat and the Democrats controlled the legislature, the governor's office ran the caucuses. And once I came in, they changed that policy, um, and there used to be someone from the governor's office in the caucus, but not in the speaking role. And then eventually, within a year, they said nobody from the governor's office is allowed in the caucus. Going back to like 75? 75, yeah. It, it, it stopped uh, unless the governor wanted to come in. But even now, it's just that nobody's allowed in other than senators or assembly people is strictly for the members of the legislature and nobody else. Is there anything else big that eroded the power of the governor vis-a-vis -vis the legislature? Yeah, and I, go ahead. I think the, the growth of staff. So instead of relying on the governor's office to explain a bill why they want amendments, you didn't need them anymore. You had your own staff, people who had um, a specialty, uh, I used to call them like doctors, somebody who had new environment, somebody new education. So you didn't have to rely on the governor's office anymore for information about whether it's their bills or somebody else's. So you had your own staff. When I got there, the assembly, we had, what, 64 Democrats roughly, or 66, and we had a secretary and two people for a staff. I mean, that was it. You had and, one executive today, director. Today, you have maybe 40, 50, uh, at least. So you didn't even have a district office, Mike. Uh, I was an assemblyman to Senator Dodd, and he had his, quote-unquote, legislative office in his bar because you weren't given any money to have an office. So you either did it out of your house when or from your business in, office. The, the district office? The district office started roughly about 76, 77, Mike. Uh, how about the creation of legislative leadership PACs? Did that also erode the power of the governor in some way? And well, it increased the power of the legislature. So by not having to rely on the governor to raise money for the legislative races, clearly, once again, they were not as, as big as an influence as they had been before. So that was a big significant change. So the governor of New Jersey is less powerful than he or she used less to be? Less powerful in terms vis-a-vis their interactions with the legislature, without question. Is he still constitutionally uh, maybe the most powerful among all governors? Because we don't elect statewide people. Now you go to Texas and you have a milk commissioner, a land commissioner, a gas commissioner, everything else elected, attorney generals. In New Jersey, we don't. We elect a governor. Now we do a, well, we don't even elect the lieutenant governors. He or she's a ride uh, along for the ride. They're selected by uh, the gubernatorial uh, nominee. That's that's a big difference. So, 
in terms of being able to dispense patronage, the governor is very powerful. Uh, when you started in the legislature, legislative leadership turned over every every year, every year or every yeah. two. Well, it was no, it was every year, Mark. every year. And then it, when did that change? It it started to change in the seventies. So in the assembly, which is a two-year term of office, uh, it changed every year. It was something that just it was a ceremonial thing, and then it changed to. And it, by the way, it was the Senate was the same as well, because my first year, Pat Dodd was president of the Senate. Next year, he was not. So then they decided, mm, you know, maybe two years. Then, of course, you know, two years becomes four years, and four years becomes six or whatever. So that certainly was a uh, significant change uh, to the point where the argument was, is it going to be ceremony or is it going to be permanent leadership? I fall somewhere in between. Uh, I kind of look at it as a, um, someone who's a mayor or a governor. Uh, I don't think you should, I think there should be term limits on uh, executives. Even though you did what, 10 years as Senate president or 10 as Senate eight. Democratic leader, eight as Senate president? Oh, I, well I was a minority leader for four years and then became co-president of the Senate for two and then president of the Senate for six. It seems about right to you, or well, according to my um, uh, nemesis, that was a little too long. <laughs> but no, it's about right, Mike. Um, let's go back into the seventies, early seventies. How'd you get into politics? Um, I got into politics as a kid in Orange. We used to let every politician who was running hire us to rip down their opponent's signs. And they all ran at large, so you know, it, was, it was a good way to make some extra money. So that really sparked my interest. I had an uncle who ran for commissioner, but my father always stayed out of politics because he was a local funeral director. My family lived up top of the funeral home, and he always thought it was best you know, not to take sides. And he's, he's correct. Uh, just doesn't do any good politically. And at that time, it was... Um, you know, it was a um, rough and tumble political town. I mean, they took it very seriously. You know, it was not strange to see every, you, about 20 people would run for five seats, and each of them would have at least 10 cars painted with their name on it. <laughs> it's just, it was a blood sport. What was the ethnic makeup of the town in those days? Um, it was mostly Irish and Italian, and... Uh, I would say 20% African American. And today? Today, um, probably 10% uh, white, 20% um, Hispanic, and the rest African American. So there's been a big demographic change in, in that city. Who were the powers in Essex County politics at that time? Well, Dennis Carey was the uh, Democratic chairman back then. Uh, when I first ran, it was Harry Lerner. Who was the chairman? He, you know, they controlled the freeholder board, and there, there was no county executives at all back then. So the county chairmen were very powerful. But unlike today, where some of them are what I would call bosses or bullies, Harry Lerner, although he had power, was never a boss, you know, or a bully. The only time I ever remember him asking us how to vote was uh, the governor had obviously burn, had called them and said he wanted to make sure the Essex delegation was going to vote for the increase, uh, well, not the increase, to put in place an income tax. So um, for my district, which was more poor than, than wealthy, it was a correct vote. And I remember in the room was a gentleman by the name of Bob Ruan who had gotten elected in a Republican district in, right after Watergate. So, I mean, it was easy to win, you know, if you were a Democrat. And so he looked at the chairman and said, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, I'll do what you want, but I could, don't ever ask me to vote for a bill that allows abortion. And he looked at him and said, I don't give a blank about abortion. All I care about is getting judges made. <laughs> that was it. But um, I did ask um, the administration for a favor. 280, 
uh, that runs through Essex County, the heart of Essex County, had just been built and there was no exit in Orange. And as a result, they created a huge bottleneck in West Orange for the first exit uh, because everybody who lived or were going, were going to Orange lined up to get off West Orange and it was a huge problem. So on a Sunday night, I get a call from Alan Sagner, the DOT commissioner, asking if he could come over and see me. And I said, okay. And he said, listen, we're going to do this exit in Orange for you, you know, if you vote for the income tax. And I was already voting for it anyway. And uh, when it got built, they actually put, you know, work for my dad, did everything, picking up dead bodies, you name it. Um, he was for a while a county coroner, which you didn't get paid for. But you were able to get more funerals than you otherwise would because you picked up the body. But the county coroner picks up every body that dies unnaturally. So there's no kind of death that I didn't see. Hmm. Whatever gr gruesome death you could ever think of, I saw as a teenager. But I also learned, watching my father, how to be compassionate with people and understanding. And he was, was good at that. Oh, he was he was the best, the absolute best, and never work, uh, never woke up uh, a day where he didn't put a shirt and tie on suit. That's he felt you had to be a professional, hmm. and he was very good with people. Uh, who was the first governor you recall? Well, not knowing anything about. Um, oh boy, I would say a little bit about Minor. And then Cahill, I remember an ad that he'd never lost a race and he used to be in the FBI. Um, so I served under him for one week. Uh huh. And then Byrne came in, of course. Right. And, but it was easy. When Byrne ran, we had Watergate and he lived in my district. So, I mean, I could have gone to Paradise Island for three months and still won the election. It was an easy election district then. and. Uh, if I hear that old district back, it's pretty democratic, putting it mildly. You say Minor and Cahill, but Hughes was for eight years in between. Were you aware of Hughes? I was aware of him because of the um, Mike Douglas show that my mom used to watch, and his wife would appear on the Mike Douglas show. Betty Hughes. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, and I, you know, I got to know him later on in life, and he was a big fan of mine, and he. He was, he was really good to me whenever he saw me. Uh, do you recall when you first uh, met Brendan Byrne or became aware of Brendan Byrne? Oh, he used to play tennis with my dad. So I was well aware of him. And I, I knew that his father dated my grandmother. His father dated your grandmother yes. before she married your grandfather. That's correct. <laughs> so I don't know whether she made a mistake or not. <laughs> she, could, she could have had a governor. <laughs> what was Byrne at the time when you met him? A judge, a prosecutor? Um, both. Uh -huh. He had segued from prosecutor to the BPU maybe. Right. Or um, a judgeship. But I also, my, um, as a teenager, one of my side jobs was um, working for the limousine company that uh, serviced my dad's funeral home with limousines. And uh, on more than one occasion, I would be sent up to the Kane estate to pick up uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kane, the governor's uh, parents. His father was a congressman. Yeah, had been, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, so who did you know first, Tom Kane or Brendan Burns? Tom Kane, the governor, I knew from being the son of the people former you drove. congressman. Right, right. And I told a uh, young Mr. Kane who serves with me now. I said, you know, I used to uh, chauffeur for your grandparents. So he says to me, you don't have to tell me. He said, my grandfather never tipped you. I said, you're right, I'm living proof. <laughs> he said, for whatever reason, uh, Senator, he just did not believe in tipping people. <laughs> uh, his, his son has a reputation for frugality as well, does he not? Tom, Tom the, governor. the governor. Oh, yes. Yes, but, it, you know, they used to tease him about his wardrobe and how old it was. But once he became governor, he, I think he went out and bought a few more suits and ties. Uh, and, and an easy person to work with. You know, it was a delight to, you know, even though I was a Democrat, you know, I enjoyed serving under uh, Tom Kane. Did you enjoy serving under Brendan Byrne? Oh, absolutely. Tell us about 
those years? What what what, well, what I jumps worked, to mind? Working on the casino bill. You know, we spent a lot. I spent a lot of time in his office, going over the nitty gritty of the casino bill. Were you a champion of casino gambling? I've never gambled <coughs> in a casino in my life to this day. Um, Were but, you a sponsor of the bill? No, but what I became was the architect of how we would implement casino gaming uh, in the uh, state of New Jersey. So. And the reason I was selected was because I was chairman of a committee and I was single. And I had the time to spend, you know, so I was sent all over the world looking at casinos, whether it was England or the islands, or Las Vegas or whatever. And I can remember one time. It was a tough gig. Yeah, it was really tough. <laughs> one time I'm sent to um, Las Vegas and the governor, Governor Byrne, called me and said, listen, I know blank at this hotel, casino and I'll make sure you meet with him. So when I get back, I said to him, he's governor, you know, when he lived in New Jersey, he was a bookmaker. And he said, Dick, that's how I knew him. That's <laughs> 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 <It's> okay. <laughs> uh, was it tough getting a casino bill passed? It took a, a while um, to get all that done. I mean, it, this was brand new to us. The only other jurisdiction we could look at was Las Vegas, and we didn't want to be like Las Vegas. You know, then he had the other thing is the press kept saying, the mob's going to be involved, the mob's going to be involved, which I thought was overblown, but we had to be conscious of that when we wrote the laws. Later on, you know, we let go of a lot of that stuff because now you're dealing with publicly traded companies. Um, back then, you know, a lot of them were not. You needed a referendum to... There was a referendum. Well, well, there was a f one referendum. I think was in seventy four, seventy five. Failed. So they brought it back in a different fashion, saying, "If you say yes to casino gaming in Atlantic City, this money will go to senior citizens and the disabled for prescriptions and other things." And as a result of that change, it passed. Uh, looking back now, uh, are there? Is there anything that should have been in the legislation that wasn't, or vice versa? No, I, I think mean, the, the, the one bad thing is when you look at Atlantic City back then and look at the amount of population within driving distance to Atlantic City, which is roughly about 150 million people at least, you, know, you realize all they had to do was open the doors and you're going to be incredibly successful. You didn't need to... You know, we required them to have certain amenities, but they never really, you know, created Atlantic City as a resort designation, and that was a mistake, and it's caught what, up with them. What, what would have, what, what would have enhanced Atlantic well, City? Well, you have to understand, the weather's different than Las Vegas. That's a given, but they didn't create the kind of atmosphere. I mean, ten years after casino gaming was. Uh, approved, the boardwalk still looked like it looked like before you had casino gaming. You know, you'd walk by a store and they'd have rotten stuff to sell, not classy stuff. You know, they should have just broke down the whole boardwalk and started from scratch. How you much know. progress have they made in that regard now? I don't think they've made a lot, to be honest with you. You know, they made too much money by just by opening their doors. And now the competition's here. You know, some people say it's too late. We'll see. Uh, would it have passed the Casino uh, Act without Brendan Byrne spearheading it? I think it would have because um, there was a lot of major players that contributed to the referendum. I can remember as being chairman of the city of Orange, Mike, and uh, you would go down to the county chairman's office to pick up your literature for election day. And when I picked up all the bags for the committee people in the city of Orange, it was loaded <laughs> from top to bottom with pro-casino literature. <laughs> so I knew right away that someone had gotten to the chairman to make sure that uh, the vote in Essex County was going to be pro-casino, and it was. Uh, should there have been some kind of commission, state commission, like the Meadowlands Commission, created 
to administer Atlantic City and oversee Atlantic City. You know, that, City. that issue came up looking back, I would say yes. Atlantic City government obviously was a failure. I think every couple of years the mayor would go off to jail. And um, they just weren't equipped to be able to handle it. Uh, it was an old form of government and it just did not work. Simple as that. It was you're asking something that was impossible. Why did that not uh, come up at the time? It, it, it did I'm in the Meadowlands. I'm not sure as to why that movement stalled, to be honest with you. I just can't recall. Uh, was Steve Persky uh, in the legislature at, at that time, do you recall? Was he, uh, did oh. he spearhead this movement in the legislature? Absolutely, positively, unequivocally, yes. He was in the Senate or the Assembly? Assembly. Assembly. And he, um, I remember him pushing the square footage. He wanted each, you know, we, we had settled that each room had to be a certain size. And he wanted it to be roughly maybe 325 square feet, which just by coincidence fit the local Howard Johnsons which his relatives owned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you had to name three people who made that casino uh, act a reality, who were the three? Brendan Byrne, Steve Persky, maybe myself, but I don't know. Um, when you were in the assembly, the Sports and Exposition Authority was uh, coming into being, was it? Correct. Did you have any involvement with that issue? No, not until later on when um, they started to assign racing bills to my committee. What committee were you? Uh, state government. State government committee. Uh, and yet today you're heavily identified with that complex. Uh, you really didn't have that much to do with, I mean, people think of you as either going to run the thing or being an active supporter of sports around the state no, and professional yeah, I'm sports. I'm very involved in sports and have been all my life. That hasn't changed till even now. I've got to leave and meet with some sports uh, people. But um, no, I was always involved in uh, legislation over there uh, from the late 70s until the 80s, but not in the beginning. That had had its roots before I got to the legislature. The creation of it was under Cahill, really. How important has it been? Uh, Sports? Authority. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, cre you, you took a swamp, and now you have a Meadowlands Chamber of Commerce. What does that say about it? Um, so instead of a swamp, you have, right now, maybe the second finest football-only stadium in the country, not financed by the public. Um, you have hotels, you have malls, you have office parks, all of which never would have existed had the state government not stepped in and did what it did. Now, my understanding of the story I was told is um, people had tried to get a racetrack up in northern New Jersey and always failed. Uh, so finally, they were able to say, hey, listen, since private industry can't do it, let's do it ourselves. And it was so successful that allowed the government to build a stadium, a football stadium, convince the Giants to leave Yankee Stadium to come to New Jersey and eventually built uh, an arena as well, all of which were very, very successful for decades and fueled that economic engine uh, over at the Meadowlands. Were there any mistakes made in the creation of the Meadowlands and the Sports Authority. No, I don't think so at all. I don't think the, the only mistake that was made was under Governor McGreevy, um, there was an individual allowed to run it himself who thought the best thing for the state was to get out of the sports business. And that's the reason we created the Sports Authority to bring Major League Sports to New Jersey. And as a result, you know, we created a whole economic engine. Uh, George Zoffinger, it's not a mystery who, who he was. George Zoffinger, what, 
presided when Xanadu was created. Is, is that something that you think is, was a mistake? If I had been governor earlier, it never would have happened. NJSEA is Sports and Exhibition Authority, not malls. You know, essentially what he was doing was turning the Sports Authority into a landlord. If I had not come along at the time when I did, um, the Jets certainly weren't going to stay there. And I think eventually the Giants would have left. The Giants were under a lease uh, from 1995 that said, you must renovate the stadium to modern standards. So Mr. Joffinger refused to follow the lease. The Giants went to court and said they owe us $400 million in renovations. He agreed to at least 150. Split it down the middle, that's $300 million. People forget that, that as a result of my stepping in, having them build their own stadium, taxpayers were relieved of that burden. But, you know, every team wanted out, and that's the Nets. Um, the Giants, really, if they could find a spot, would leave. The Jets were going to get $600 million to go to the west side of Manhattan, sponsored by Bloomberg, and he said he might give them up to a billion dollars. Uh, the Metro Stars were leaving, and now they're in their own brand new soccer stadium. So all the teams were looking to exit based on somebody's personality, and that was unfortunate. Uh, how do you see the future of the sports authority now? That's interesting. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, here in New Jersey, the casinos have so much influence that we don't have slot machines at racetracks like all the other states surrounding us and most states throughout the country. Uh, we want to always do something to help the casinos, but nothing um, for the racetracks, which obviously suffered as a result of competition from the uh, casinos. So what other states have done is allow them to have slot machines at racetracks, and they're big money makers. And it makes no sense for us here, especially in northern New Jersey, to allow people to go to Yonkers, and now they're going to be going to Yonk, uh, Belmont and Aqueduct for slots, and we do nothing. We lose, we lose all that revenue. Then we lose all the jobs, close down the racetracks, all the horse farms close, are developed. It'd be a disaster, but we're close to being a disaster because the casinos are protected, and that's sad. And it's, what makes it even worse is the casinos created their own competition. Casinos in New Jersey, the companies, have put slot machines at racetracks in Philadelphia. <laughs> makes no sense, it's sad. Oh, uh, the Nets are leaving for Newark, leaving the Meadowlands for Newark next year. Um, is that a, a blow to the Meadowlands or the future of the Meadowlands? Um, it all depends upon what you do with that arena. I think it can exist and make a small amount of profit as long as they do everything in concert with the Newark arena, as opposed to being against each other for <coughs> entertainment acts. It makes absolutely no sense. Now, I think the team's going to be much better. Obviously, it would be impossible to be any worse than they are this year. So I think the attendance in Newark for the next couple of years, I think it's going to take three years myself, will be great. But what happens after the Nets uh, move on to Brooklyn? Um, looking back to the 70s, uh, you mentioned casino gambling. What were your issues? What, what was your focus as a legislator in the assembly? Well, to, uh, well, for a good six months or so, or maybe a year, was to, rate, to uh, create the New Jersey Casino Control Act. And um, that took quite a bit of my time. I mean, as I said, traveling all over the world, learning about an industry I knew nothing about, uh, talking to people and trying to do the right thing. Um, trying to ward off some of this criticism that we're going to let the mob get involved, which never happened. Um, and I think as a result, um, I thought we did a very good job. Now we've changed it as time has grown, and as time goes on, and um, I think we did a good job. There was never any finding of any direct um, influence uh, by the mob in ownership 
of casinos. Um, they tried to do some things with unions, but that was it. So we were successful. They were successful. And um, the thing that would bother me, though, is that um, we'd have these national stories that Atlantic City has casinos that are make millions of dollars in store. There's still poor people in Atlantic City. I didn't know where you're supposed to give them all a hundred thousand uh, dollars. I mean, I just couldn't understand that criticism. There was people in casinos making fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars that heretofore were unemployed. They had no jobs. I mean, I remember when the referendum passed in November, maybe of '76, roughly, and I went down to see the people who owned resorts and who owned a hotel, a down and out hotel, but a big one in Atlantic City. And they told me there was two people staying in the hotel that night, and one of them was president of the company. So that showed you how bad Atlantic City was before casinos. I'm sorry, I, I was looking at that. Repeat that anecdote, please. In December, a month after the referendum passed, I went to Atlantic City to meet with the president of Resorts International, which owned a, a hotel, a large hotel, in Atlantic City. And he told me in the hotel that night were two guests, himself, and somebody else. So, I mean, that shows you very vividly how bad Atlantic City was. It, you could just have floated to hotels out into the ocean and nobody would have cared. Uh, it was as dead as uh, Asbury Park had become uh, since their heyday, back in the 50s and 60s. One of your colleagues in the state senate, Jim Whalen, uh, has a proposal in now to uh, allow smaller hotels, casino hotels in Atlantic City what do you think of that idea? Well, we're going to do that. Why don't we put the casino, the slot machines at racetracks? I mean, what those are are not boutique uh, casinos. They're grind uh, joints is what they call them in Las Vegas. They're slot machine parlors. Simple as that. And uh, I would be opposed to it. And I, I see where even the uh, casino owners are opposed to it. And unions. And it just, that's the last thing... When we looked at um, Las Vegas, the last thing we wanted to do were allow just slot machine parlors. You wanted to have all the amenities that a major hotel in Las Vegas had. We required them to have a showroom, um, so many restaurants. Uh, I could go on and on. And we didn't make uh, we made the laws so that the casino gaming floor wasn't the focal point of the hotel. When Brendan Byrne uh, famously stood on the boardwalk, I guess when he signed the bill oh, yeah. and uh, turned to the cameras and s said, I, and I have a message for the mob, keep your dirty hands out of Atlantic City. Were you there that day? No, I wasn't there, but it was a great line. <laughs> Politically, he couldn't have done any better. Uh, how does Atlantic City uh, recover, if not by allowing smaller hotels. Well, obviously they're in a re they're suffering from the national recession and competition, like any other business. Um, so they're looking for new ways to make money, and sports betting, which probably will never happen. Um, so they're they're in the same boat that um, racetracks are as well. So you you think it's a bleak future for Atlantic City? No, I don't say that. You know, they have to reinvent themselves. And listen, they've got competition. They all knew it was coming. But, Mike, they're also in competition with themselves. So while Atlantic City, somebody's Atlantic City Hotel is down in Revenue, they got slot machines at other places in Philadelphia where they're making more money than they ever did. So when you add the two together, they're doing very well. Now, the Atlantic City property may be down because they opened up 20 miles away from themselves. But overall, it was a good business decision. And those are at racetrack. Some say New Jersey has overregulated uh, Atlantic City and kicked some of the more creative casino executives out, like the Perlmans and Steve Wynn, how do you view that statement? Nobody kicked Steve Wynn out. He left on his own. But maybe because the climate was hostile t toward him. Ah. You don't buy it? No. 
He's a showman. God bless. And by the way, a big sports fan, especially college basketball. Um, when you think about Brendan Byrne, what accomplishments jump to mind? Uh, the Pinelands, um, casino gaming, uh, creation of the income tax for education, things like that, and, and a man of integrity, decency, and honor. A successful governor? Well, he wasn't recognized as a successful governor when he was, um, but I would argue that um, having gotten reelected was successful. You know, but as time went on, people realized more and more what kind of a person he was and the things that he did do and did accomplish and the kind of person he was. You were his ally? Absolutely. I mean, we disagreed on occasion. And he one time called the, um, when I, I didn't like the idea necessarily of public financing of campaigns, and he did call the chairman, which I resented. Tell me more. He called the chairman to... To say yeah, lean yeah. on Cody and get him to support this, right? And the chairman then called you, right? He said, "Listen, I don't really give a flying whatever, <laughs> but the guy called me." <laughs> I said, "Okay." Did it sway you at all? No. What was your problem with public financing of campaigns? Well, I didn't think we necessarily had to have taxpayers paying for campaigns. You know, and then when you finally got the decision that. The wealthy can spend whatever they want to. It's you know it skewed politics tremendously. One could say you were a victim of that, so to speak. You know, in I would agree with that. <laughs> but you what? I would agree with that. <laughs> um, during the income tax fight, uh, who were the key players in the legislature? Let's start in the with legislature. the legislature. Um, Joe LaFonte, out of Hudson County, um, Howard Woodson, Reverend Woodson, um, Bill Hamilton, people like that. But it was, it was drudgery, it was painful. How so? Well, because they had to get to 41, and um, they weren't getting there. And so we'd go down there and sit there, and there was no air conditioning except downstairs. So everybody would try to run, run in downstairs, you know, just to keep cool. That was painful. And then you had the TV lights, which only made it worse. So instead of being 90, it was like 110. What was LaFonte like? He was a good guy. A colorful Hudson County politician. You know, street guy. Understood people. Knew how to talk to people. But he always told me the story about... Um, uh, Speaker Jackman, that the governor had them over to Morvin for dinner. And um, gazpacho was served as the soup. And the speaker took a mouthful of it and says, Joe, goddamn soup is cold. <laughs> <laughs> what was Woodson like? Um, oh, he was a showman. Um, you never knew which color of the day it was, because if he had a green suit on, he had a green shirt and a green tie, green shoes and green socks. Wow. If it was purple, it was all purple. Wow. If it was black, it was all black. <laughs> was he speaker? Uh, he was speaker for a year. For a year. And also a minister. Now, who was the third uh, assembly leader you mentioned? You said LaFonte, Woodson, and Bill Hamilton. And Bill was Hamilton. What was then? Hamilton like? Bill was very much an intellectual, um, but down to earth, and understood politics, and uh, was a good speaker. So those were the principal players. Somewhat Alan Karcher, but he hadn't really come into um, being, you know, a top figure in the legislature at that point. But certainly, he was a voice that was listened to. And Al Bernstein, who I always had tremendous respect for. If I had ever become governor earlier than I did, I would have put him in the Supreme Court in a heartbeat. Probably one of the most intellectually knowing persons I've ever had the pleasure of dealing with, and one of the finest gentlemen I've had the pleasure of dealing with. 
Karcher was a smart guy too, was he not? He was. Uh, I thought he made a mistake running against Byrne. I mean, running against Kane. In 85. Uh, whenever that, mm, whatever year that was. Well, he ran for governor in 89, but he was Kane's antagonist in the legislature in the mid 80s. Yeah, I just thought he was too negative. And I used to say to him, you know, you got to pick your spots. If you're negative every day, you know, after a while, people don't listen to you. But was Ken Gewertz a player in the income tax? Uh... <laughs> you know, he, he was a player, but he was playing with <laughs> people other than uh, political leaders. <laughs> Very colorful. <laughs> uh, how about you? What was... Aside from trying to seek uh, uh, some relief in the basement, what were you doing during those? Oh, and trying to get an, uh, an exit off, off of 280. What, what's your recollection of it? was a long fight, two, three year fight to get that income uh, tax payment. Two years, maybe. Two years. What was your role? Um, yeah, I was just uh, an assemblyman um, trying to make a mark for myself and I had more bills passed in the law than any other freshman legislator. So, you know, I would look at what other states were doing and try to, you know, find good bills. I would read newspapers, get ideas for bills. Hmm. So, you know, I worked and worked very hard at it. Were you know, I was single at the time, so I had the t you know, the time and the, uh, you know, I was living at home. So living I, at the funeral home? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And then eventually, um, I'd say in my late 20s, uh, we moved to a house next door. It was a big move. You and Mary Jo? No, no, I wasn't married. I didn't get married till 81. Uh -huh. um, were you afraid of uh, allying yourself with the state's first income tax? Um, listen, a lot of the mail was ugly and negative, but I started back then a practice. If you sent me a negative letter, I picked up the phone and called you. So while they may not be happy with what I, the way I was voting, they respected the fact that I called them. And I do that today as well. As I recall, you also uh, called a dozen or two used to, anyway, call a dozen or two dozen constituents on a Sunday night randomly. Oh, absolutely. It? Still do that. Still do that? Oh, absolutely. And it's still, well, back in uh, when I thought I'd have a challenge in a year or two, I would try to do 1,500 uh, a year. Voters who I didn't know. Hmm. Random out of the phone book? or No, from the voting list. Uh -huh. Which I enjoyed. I enjoyed talking to people and I enjoyed meeting people and you know, interacting with people, so it was easy for me. Was it the Supreme Court that forced that income tax vote that finally succeeded by threatening to close the schools? No, I just think we got worn down. You know, for me, as I said, for my district and what they were going to receive in benefits, it was a correct vote. It was worn a vote. down by the governor's office? Everybody. You know, the proponents of it special interest groups that were for it, you know, it just was something that uh, wouldn't go away. Who were those special interest groups? The educational people, um, good government folks, you know, there was, you know, there was, as much it was, as it was not favored, there was a lot of interest groups that were strictly for the income tax, as a, saw it as a benefit to the state of New Jersey. Who in the governor's office did the heavy lifting on that? Do you recall? Uh, I would say what Leon, Caden. Uh, I think was Harold there in that time. I don't know. I don't think so. Um, what were they like, Leon and Caden? Um, I would say neither one of them was uh, someone you wanted to go to a bar have dinner with and watch a game with. Put it that way. All business. Uh, more, you know, the 
intellectual type and not the, you know, homegrown, you know, down to earth, can relate to the common person on the street. Who in the governor's office uh, over those two terms could you relate the best to? Um, okay, Harold Hodes. Um, what was her name? Jerry English. Um, was bright, talented, had a personality. Harold understood the street. Bob understood the legislature. So I mean, I thought his second term was really great in terms of the people that he surrounded himself with. Were you surprised that he won re-election? Not shocked, but I think surprised, but not shocked. Clearly. I mean, you know, he was always called, as we all know, OTB, one-term burn, because of the income tax. But like anything else, time can heal a lot of wounds. Um, you say that uh, Leon and Caden were kind of... Uh, stiff. Stiff. Well, I, I guess I said. How about Brendan Byrne? Nah, he, um, he, he, could, he could be a lot of fun. Was yeah. he aloof? Some would say that. I didn't necessarily find him aloof. Not at all. He could be fun. Yeah, I have a picture somewhere where the two of us have boxing gloves on going at each other because he was fighting Ali or something and he had some gloves in his office and we were clowning around. Uh, how do you view now, 34 years later, the whole school reform effort that grew out of that income tax, the Abbott decision, the court mandates, uh, etc.? The idea uh, was right, but it's never really shown that money is the answer, clearly. Did the courts try to micromanage the situation too much? Well, I don't think courts should ever legislate. Did they in this instance? Well, they do in a lot of instances. My thing is, if you want to legislate, take off the black robes and put your name on the ballot. You sound like Jerry Cardinale. Well, that's frightening. <laughs> <laughs> um, when was it that you went undercover at Marlboro Psychiatric Hospital? Um, that was roughly about 88. Oh, that late. Okay, we're yeah. into the Kane years now. Yeah, that's okay. right, it was. All right. So your interest in those issues, uh, the mental health issues, right. wasn't really active in the 70s? Oh, no, no, no. It had been active for me since the 60s. As a son of a funeral director, um, you know, regularly I was sent up to Greystone Psychiatric Hospital to pick up a body which was the largest morgue that I had ever seen, and I've been in a lot of morgues, shall we say. And um, you would go to the main office, they would give you the key and a uh, patient to help you take the body off the slab and onto the stretcher. So at that time I was in my late teens, and the patient they gave me even was roughly the same age. And as we were riding down to the morgue, he was telling me about some horror stories about what was going on at the mental institution. And um, I remember reading on a Sunday literature, not too long after that, an expose about really bad conditions up there. So it always stuck in my mind to try to do something about it. So when I became chairman of the Senate Health Committee was when you know, I really took hold and had a position that would enable me to visit these institutions, get a sense of what was going on, and after I did visit them all, I had a sense that, you know, maybe our staff wasn't as good as we should have. So using a friend in the unions, I was able to get the uh, Social Security number of all the workers in our mental institutions. Found out roughly 30% of them had criminal records, um, ranging anywhere from murder to shoplifting. And I disclosed that. And they said, well, geez, as a result of what Cody has found out, from now on we will take fingerprints of every employee and run record checks. So about six months later, I got a tip from somebody up at the Greystone who said they take the prints, but they don't really run a record on them. And the people coming for a job who are friends with those who are already employed know that. 
So we're essentially still hiring the same people. So at that point, I got a friend in the corrections department to give me the ID of both a uh, convicted rapist and a murderer. And I merged it too, so it made it easy to check my background. I gave the social security number of the one criminal and the birth date and name of the other criminal. So it made it real easy to find out who I really was. And I applied for a job there as a, what you would call an orderly, working with direct contact with the patients. They never looked into my background. They never checked any of my references and hired me for the midnight shift where my first night at work, I walked in and the head nurse was um, laying on a couch with a blanket on her and a pillow on her head watching TV. And um, she told me that, listen, um, you know, the rules are you're not supposed to watch TV or sleep or whatever. And she said to me, you get that, don't you? I said, I get it. I think it would be useful at this point to ask you for a thumbnail sketch of each of the governors of your tenure. Your, ten your 37 years in Trenton. Uh, Byron Kane on up. Uh, give us a thumbnail of each person, would you? Um, Byrne had that Irish wit about him. Um, he came, he was fortunate in that some mobster said he could, couldn't be bought off and he was off and running. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I hope at some point in time he thanked that mobster for what he said about him because he certainly owed him. Not to say that he wasn't a man of integrity, he certainly was. But Brendan Byrne understood politics, um, but also understood that he had to do the right thing even if it meant it wasn't a popular thing. And I give him credit for it because putting in the first income tax was not popular. Um, saving the pine lands, certainly the right thing to do, not popular. Um, so he wasn't afraid of being unpopular if the decision that he made was the right one for the people of the state of New Jersey. And I think you have to admire that in any politician. And certainly I admire that with him, but he was certainly somebody you could talk to. Keep going, Kane. Um, Tom Kane I liked because, uh, you know, I knew the family and despite being the largest landholders in the state of New Jersey at the time, coming from incredible wealth, he had a certain uh, down to earth personality about him. And I can remember him calling me on a couple of occasions, um, just saying, Dick, I love what you did in um, the committee the other day. Um, Dick, I'd like the bill you introduced. Get it on my desk as soon as possible. So there was a common touch about him and he understood street politics, which is hard to imagine at someone of his upbringing who was schooled in New England at a boarding school and as some people would say, kind of had a strange way of clapping his hands. Um, but despite that, people of all backgrounds economically, I thought, you know, he got along with very well. And when he came into office, you know, economically, it wasn't a good situation, but he was able to change things around. And he left as a very popular governor. And um, then he became chairman of 9-11 and still clearly the most popular governor we've ever had by far. And I think it's, um, that's a great distinction for him and a great honor because he is known as a man of great integrity, but yet, you know, someone who was a very, very good governor. Jim Florio. Jim Florio was someone who talked policy almost round the clock. I mean, I remember um, being a member of leadership when he was governor, and we'd have these Monday meetings with him when the legislature was in session, and you'd walk into the meeting with him, and You'd say hello, and uh, most people would say, gee, did you see the Giant game or the Yuga game yesterday or whatever? Not with uh, Governor Florio. It was, uh, Dick, let me talk to you about the gun bill. It was, it was strictly policy. Yet you would think, being Italian-American, being from Brooklyn, being uh, an amateur fighter, that he'd walk in a room and give you a hug and a kiss, and you see the the game yesterday or whatever, and it just 
that was not him. And you had to accept it. Would he have been more successful had he had that oh, side I th of him? I think so, without question. But it just was not him. But the, well, the other thing I remember about him was I served with him in the assembly. And people don't, you know, don't even realize he was in the assembly. And when he was in the assembly, there was a bank of phones in the back of the chamber. And he was constantly on the phone because he was running for, gov uh, for a congressman. So he, you know, that's what he was, he really wasn't interested in being in the assembly anymore. He was trying to get to Congress, which eventually he did. Then I can remember when he ran for governor the first time, uh, he had uh, an office, his office was in East Orange. And so I would see him down here all the time, you know, having lunch or whatever. And um, then he ran again, and I thought there was no way Tom Kane could beat him. And sure as hell, and I, I thought even the governor, I um, substituted for uh, Jim Florio against the governor like about four days before the election right here in West Orange. And the way he was talking to me was he didn't think he was going to win. and. Uh, Sure enough, on election day, he won by just a few votes, but he won. Took three weeks to sort it out. Yeah. Um, Christy Whitman. Um, someone who I just, you know, I like personally, but I just didn't understand why every <laughs> Republican member of the legislature almost didn't like her. And I just thought that she never, ever had the sense to pick up the phone and say, John, Bill, Jane, Sue, you know, what can I do for you? Can we talk about your bill? You know, she just didn't have that. I mean, I was minority leader uh, when she was governor for four years. And if I were in that position, if I were governor and she was minority leader, if she was in Trenton, I would pick up the phone and say, um, you know, why don't you come up to governor's office and let's have lunch? Or... Um, you know, would you like the governor's box to see the hockey game? She just, those kinds of things that uh, most politicians would think of, she just never did. So she never ever got along with the legislature. Not that she ever did anything to hurt me or was ever mean-spirited to me, but the incredible thing was most of the um, animosity in the legislature about her came from her own party <laughs> as opposed to the Democratic Party. Uh, she once told me a story uh, that her father, who you know was uh, well, state bigger. Republican chairman, told her, uh, you, don't worry about the Democrats, it's the Republicans who will try to stab you in the back if you ever get too big. Um, well, the way things unfolded, um, he was right. Do you think that her uh, lack of... Uh, inclination to pick up the phone and, and to try to court legislators was a function of her being a woman and not coming up well, through that old boy network kind of thing? I don't think it had anything to do with gender in any way, shape, or form. It's just the way that she was either raised or just her own personality. I mean, Tom Kane uh, came from the same socioeconomic... But uh, was a man. He was a man who went so to boys' what? boarding school. Yeah, okay, that's not exactly where the men's men's go to get school. I mean, I got schooled in the streets, but um, he understood the streets, and maybe that was from living in Essex County. But, you know, the things that a normal politician would think of doing in terms of interacting, the show, here, and here's someone who comes from great wealth and so forth and so on, so how do you break that barrier between yourself and all these other people who come from a much lower socioeconomic background is reaching out for them and saying, listen, despite that, I can talk your talk and walk your walk. And she just never reached out to do that. And I thought it was a terrible judgment call on her part and her staff's as well. You never really got to know the person. I didn't dislike her. Unfortunately, I just didn't get to know her as well as I would have liked to. Uh, Acting Governor DeFrancesco, who we now call governor because you passed a law <laughs> that said that anybody who served acting for longer than 180 days, days, was it 60 or 180, uh, shall be known as governor. governor. So, so Governor was, DeFrancesco, what, what about him? Oh, I like Don a lot. I mean, I always felt that he felt he was one of us. 
in the legislature. And he understood what someone in the legislature needs. And as governor, he would constantly reach out, say anything I can do for you. He was down to earth. He never gave you the impression he was better than you because he was governor. I mean, just the opposite. I still savor some of the notes he sent me when he was governor. So, I mean, I had um, just good impressions of Don. Um, I never had a, I was minority leader. I, I don't know if I ever criticized him one time. Um, I just liked him that much. And I uh, felt a little bad um, the way his term ended but uh, someone who I like personally. When you and, say that, you mean the fact that he had to withdraw from running for right, the election? Right, and gone through a couple of, maybe uh, two or three months of some painful things. Um, but, you know, as I said, you know, somebody who really cared about people on a basic level. For the record, the painful things were stories in the New York Times about his finances and yeah, that and kind of thing. Different stuff that, you know, is upsetting to a family. And, you know, I understand why he didn't run. Now, I think he would have blamed that all on Mr. Schundler. And that very well may be true. But I don't know. That's Republican politics. Got enough problems with Democratic politics. Well, let's get back to Democrats because they took over uh, Jim McGreevy. Jim McGreevy. Um a man that um, would go to every first communion if he could, or every bar mitzvah, or every political dance, or church dance, or whatever. He just loved to go to functions. And um, I never saw anything like it in my life. I had once, uh, I was for him, and uh, I remember calling Mayor James at the time you were for him when the Democrats were choosing up sides between him and Rob Andrews? That's correct. Uh -huh. So I called Mayor James, and he said, Dick, I can go for him because Andrews doesn't think like we do, but you got to tell him to stay out of my office. <laughs> <laughs> so I called him up and I said, listen, if you want the mayor's endorsement, don't go to his office anymore. <laughs> Would you say he was driven? Is that what it was? He was driven beyond what was normal. There's no question about it. Um, and looking back, there just was never any balance in his life. His whole life was politics, and that essentially was all he could really talk about. You know, he didn't show any interest in anything other than being successful in politics. And even in the state senate, he really didn't stand out as a state senator. He was more interested in doing what he had to do to become governor. Um, so, I mean, you, you could look at him and say, why did he do these different things? And I, I think it would be a great study, to Got be it. honest with you. Um, short of how it ended for him, right. was his tenure, his term, his three years, were, were they a failure? Were they mixed? Were they I think successful? They were, I think they were mixed, and I think part of Jim's problem was he wanted everybody to like him. And I'd say to him, Jim, I just had two groups on opposite sides of the issue tell me, both of them, that you agree with them. And he would do that with almost every group. And then, you know, it would catch up to him. But he wanted to please everybody. You can't be a good politician by trying to please everyone. If you don't have people who are your enemies or don't agree with you, then you're not doing your job but he wanted to please people all the time. And I can remember talking to him about, you know, you're governor now, you don't have to go to all these functions, you gotta stop it, it's not gubernatorial. And he said, I understand it, I understand it, my wife's telling me the same thing, and he called me three months later, and it was about seven o'clock, and there was a lot of noise in the background, and I said to him, Jim, where are you? Oh, he said, I'm marching in the Tom's River Halloween Parade. And I said, boy, my, my talk was very successful. <laughs> the next governor was you for 14 months, I believe. That's correct. How did well, you I always say 14 months plus three because the three months before I became governor, I, when I was a governor in waiting, <laughs> we were essentially the, the governor's office, which was very hard with a limited staff. But How did you do in your own estimation? 
I thought we did as well as we possibly could within four months. Um, we got things accomplished that a lot of editorial writers say the most governors couldn't do in um, four years. Um, so I think our accomplishments were significant. I worked at the job. I enjoyed the job. Um, there wasn't too many days where I disliked the job. Were there any? Oh, I'm, I'm sure there were. There was days. There was days um, where you didn't like it because when you're governor, when you wake up in the morning and you've got a schedule, you have no idea what's going to happen that day. That's going to turn that schedule totally around. Whether somebody dies, whether there's a blizzard, a hurricane, a huge fire somewhere, um, a disaster somewhere else. Something happens during that day that's going to change that particular day. I mean, that's the way it is when you're governor. I can remember my birthday being woke early and I'm told there's a huge oil spill in the Delaware River. So as soon as it becomes light out, I'm picked up in a helicopter and we fly over the Delaware River. I meet with the officials from South Jersey. Uh, I meet with the Coast Guard and everybody else, spend the whole day down there. Um, making sure what we, that we do what we have to do um, now that we've got this huge spill in the Delaware River. The other thing I remember about the Delaware River is that eventually we wanted to um, build a port in South Jersey for a company who wanted to come into South Jersey, create maybe 600 jobs, and the state of Delaware was against it. And the way it is and is now is that Half of the Delaware River belongs to Delaware, New Jersey is responsible for the other half. So somebody in the House of Representatives in Delaware put a bill in calling on the Congress to declare that Delaware were, owns all the Delaware River. So the reporters asked what my response was, and I said very simply, in a war, we'll kick their ass. <laughs> uh, what surprised you about the job of being governor that you didn't know before? Um, how enjoyable it could be in terms of doing things for people. Like when I was governor and it was July and it was hot and humid and I said to my staff, you know, I don't think at Greystone we have air conditioning for the patients in their rooms. I said, I'm going to go up there. And they're like, oh, that's, that's not a good idea, whatever. So I'm doing it. So we got a thermometer next door for a dollar. I went up there and sure enough the rooms were like 110 degrees. and. Um, the only thing there was was some fans in the hallways. So I brought the CEO in and I said, in two weeks, every one of these rooms is going to have air conditioning. Do you understand me? Yes, I do. And in two weeks, they all had air conditioning. So to improve the lives of those people who are poor people who have mental illness, who in many cases have families have abandoned them, just to get them air conditioning during the summer is so meaningful to them in their lives. And when your governor you can order those things to be done. When you're a legislator, you can fight for them, but you can't order them to be done right away. And as governor, you can get it done right away. We had in New Jersey, we, were, we fought for like 10, 12 years to try to get a bill out of committee that banned smoking in public places. Never got the light of day. So when I was governor, I had made a commitment that I was gonna get it done. So if I didn't get it through the legislature, I had a backup that we didn't tell anybody about. So if we didn't get it done and they're still governor, we we're gonna have the um, commissioner of labor declare public areas a health hazard because of smoking and ban smoking in those places by executive order. So I was gonna get it done by hook or crook, but I didn't tell anybody that. So what I was able to do, I just came up with an idea one day to say, hey listen to the casinos because they were fighting it. I'll allow smoking on the gaming floor but nowhere else. And they bought into it. And two weeks before I left the office, finally after 12 years, New Jersey became roughly the 10th state in the country back then to ban smoking in public places. And it was overwhelming public support. Uh, I even get people now in the business who say, you know, Governor, you were right, I was wrong. It actually helped my business. Is that the bill you signed on a Sunday before the Tuesday when you yes. left office in at, West May, at Mayfair Farms? Uh, at the Manor. At the Manor, okay. Uh, let's move on to John Corzine. 
your thoughts on his governorship? Um, I think he was a very genuine person, uh, um, a nice person, a good human being who certainly wanted to do the right thing, but was cast in a job that your personality is highlighted. And I think um, he could be very indecisive. Some people say the last person to speak to him is where he went. And he was not able to connect with middle class people. He just couldn't walk in a room and make them feel that he was one of them. Is and I think in a chief executive, whether it's a president, a governor, or a mayor, they want to feel a personal connection to you. If you're a legislator or a councilman or a congressman, listen, as long as you vote the right way, do constituent work, that's fine. I don't have to have a personal connection with you. But a president, a governor, and a mayor, they want a personal connection to you. So when they see you in the store, they want to be able to relate to you when you're in the shop right, uh, when you're in the coffee shop. And as much as a good human being as he was, he couldn't come across as one of them. Was that more because he was worth hundreds of millions of dollars from Wall Street or because he grew up in rural Illinois on a farm and was not really in New Jersey? I think he grew up in rural uh, Illinois um, with that background. And uh, I can remember saying to him one time, I said, you know, when you give these speeches, you know, you're not very emotional, you're, even your staff. So I said to him, you know, being a funeral director's son, um, you know, the best thing to see with emotion is to go to an Italian funeral because they display a lot of emotion. Of course, a lot of people display emotions. But you want to go to a funeral where the widow wants to jump in the grave and see what emotion is because he never really displayed emotion when he spoke or as a person. And I think uh, showing your emotions is not a negative, it's very much a positive. And I just never thought he connected with middle class New Jersey. Um, and I said to him, you know, going to the Hamptons on weekends during the summer does not make a connection Saturday night dinner parties in Manhattan does not make a connection. And I also remember one time, it was after his accident, he was talking about polling and he was saying to me, you know, how bad Democrats poll in Ocean County. And he looked at me, he said, except for you. <laughs> so, um, and then he went into something that was very revealing. He said to me, Dick, I can understand why people like you. You, you, know, you got wife, two kids now. Uh, my kids, you know, I got divorced, um, and people look at me as a millionaire, multi-millionaire who bought a Senate seat and a governor's seat, and I said, nothing wrong with the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, uh, you can go F yourself, <laughs> in, a, in a kidding way. And he says, you know, Dick, but I really can't get past that or past the fact that I gave my girlfriend, former girlfriend, a lot of money. So to be seen as someone who's a good governor, I just have to do a good job. So it's not gonna be done on who I am, what I am, it's whether or not I do a good job. Does that make sense? It does, but you have to overcome the fact that you're not making the connection. So if they don't think you're necessarily doing a good job, they won't overcome. See, again, I would say if you can make that connection where they like you, you know, they're more likely to give you a break um, what they would see as bad policy. It's a little early to be talking about Chris Christie's governorship because as we tape this, it's about two months old, but... It's almost three. Uh, yeah, January. a little more than two. Um, but when you were talking about Jim McGreevy trying to please everybody and you said, you know, you got to make some enemies, um, in two short months, Governor Christie has made significant enemies, mainly in the, among the public employee unions, but that's a lot of people and some, yeah. uh, some important constituencies in the po political life of this state. How do you see his first two months so far and has he gone too far in the other direction. Well, I think when Chris gets up in the morning, he argues with the Cheerios. 
Um, but when I've said this to him, to to his face, is what he does right now has been, I think, successful in the short term. In that he picks what you would call boogeymen. These are bad people. Like when he's prosecutor, politicians are bad. I'm the prosecutor. I'm good. I'm the governor. These are the bad people. They make too much. Their benefits are too big. Um, they're screwing you. You know, so it makes good politics to always have good versus evil. But you can't create good and evil for four years. And that's as simple as that. So you build up the resume, you know, a, a residue of bad will over here. So you have to keep the good versus evil going for four years. And that's not easy. And the other thing uh, I would say, though, is that sometimes you just have to tone down the rhetoric. There's a right way to say, this is what I believe in, and I think should be done, as opposed to necessarily demonizing people. And I think that's hard for those people who have been demonized, who feel, listen, I'm making $37,000. I struggle every day. I've got a side job to make a living, to enable my children to go to junior college, pay my property taxes, pay my shopping bills or whatever, and you're making me out as a bad person, and I resent it, as opposed to, listen, most teachers are good. I'm sure the teachers his children have, he looks at as good um, teachers. So, you know, now they have this position, you know, government employees and uh, teachers that, oh, now we've been demonized as someone who's bad people who are robbing from the rest of our citizens as opposed to saying sitting down and saying listen we have some we have a problem and I want you to help me so at some point you, know, you got to turn more towards that but right now I think he's more successful than he is unsuccessful by uh, as I said creating good versus uh, evil and with his tell it like it is Style. I always say, you know, with someone who says to me, I tell like it is, you, that can turn into being rude. And well, I don't think you ever want to be seen as being rude, and I'm sure he really doesn't at all. I mean, I think he can be very much down to earth, you know, and I think he does have a life um, beyond politics. Like me, we were talking just the other day about how they were choosing the Little League teams and who he would get to coach. And whether it was fair or not, <laughs> you know, Chris, if it's not fair, Chris is going to, you know, <laughs> take you on. Well, we'll see how his governorship plays out. Let, yes, let, we will. Let's sum up uh, with this question. Um, are there any common qualities that the best governors have? Uh, an ability to connect with people, uh, an ability to get your message out within the media um, that you, your agenda out there and in a favorable way and um, just uh, try to be as honest as humanly possible and have as much integrity as possible and surround yourself with people who are good and with people who will tell you no when they think you're wrong. 